I just don't quit. <laughs> you just don't quit. I just don't quit. I mean, there's one sure way to lose and that's stopping. Uh, and I, I was just never willing to do that. And um, how, I don't know. I mean, there were times that was very, very difficult, Alex, in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, you know, these commercials would come on television with like a fried egg on, 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 on a griddle and talking about how this is your brain on drugs. And they were very much including cannabis in there. And, um, and we were really made to feel like we were pariahs. There were times when I didn't have a clue whether we were ever going to be successful. But I knew that, that for me, I just, you know, I knew the truth about this plant. I knew the potential about this plant. I knew that this plant has the ability to save this planet. And I wasn't willing to give up that possibility, that struggle. It was something that I was called to do. And I felt like I had to execute on that. Today we're talking with Stephen D'Angelo, cannabis entrepreneur, activist, author, and on-screen personality. He's the co-founder of Harborside, which is one of the first six dispensaries licensed in the US and now listed on the Canadian Stock Exchange. Steep Hill Laboratory, the first, the first dedicated lab, um, the Arcview Group, the first cannabis investment firm, and the National Cannabis Industries First Trade Association. And in 2015, he was dubbed the father of the legal cannabis industry. Today, we'll be talking about the legal cannabis industry, uh, how it started, the challenges to grow a business within this industry, and where it's going next. And just quickly before we get started, make sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Now, let's get into it. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me, Alex. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited about this topic because it's um, because within Australia, it's not yet at the level that it is in the US or Canada. And so, you know, it's not yet selling within the dispensaries to people on the street. So this conversation is um, to really understand how change happens um, and how to do business in this kind of environment, which is an interesting one. But let's start with misconceptions, right? Because I think that there are quite a lot of misconceptions around the cannabis plant because of how it's portrayed in the media. Um, so what are some of the biggest misconceptions around? Well, you know, the, 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 you, you, could, you could wrap them all into a bundle by saying that <clears throat> cannabis is, is, is a harmful substance which causes psychosis, which leads people into, into dependency, which uh, um, uh, makes them more likely to become addicted to harder drugs um, and, uh, and will basically ruin not only their lives, but the lives of everybody around them. And, um, and it's, just, it's just not true. Um, you know, cannabis now is one of the most studied plants on the planet. Uh, if you go to the databases, you'll find something close to 30,000 different published scientific reports on cannabis. And the vast majority of them demonstrate beyond any reasonable doubt that cannabis is actually a very safe and efficacious therapeutic remedy uh, for many, many, many different human ailments. It is also, and, and this is um, often not talked about enough, a remarkable raw material. Um, the way I like to describe it is, is cannabis is, is not only uh, brings us closer to nature, or wakes up our spirits and brings us closer to nature, but gives us the raw material we need to build a new life-affirming economy. So um, uh, that's, that's just a little bit of, of, of what I think is the real truth of cannabis. And so why was it made illegal? And now why is it becoming legalized again? So cannabis was made illegal in the United States, uh, mainly because of the way that it came to the country. Uh, cannabis came to the U.S. in the hands of black people and brown people. There were two vectors. One was across the southwestern border with Mexico. This happened uh, right around the time of the Mexican Revolution, around 1910, when you had hundreds of thousands of Mexican refugees who were coming into the United States and they were fleeing warfare. So they brought with them their folk medicine. Cannabis had been incorporated into the folk corandero system of medicine in Mexico for hundreds of years. Um, 
like today, uh, a lot of those brown skinned refugees were not welcomed by um, by a lot of white Americans. There was a lot of racism. It was actually much worse then than it is even today. And the first laws against cannabis in the United States date from that time, 1911, 1912, 1913. And they were state laws, uh, California, uh, Texas, Arizona, states that bordered uh, Mexico. And then later on, you saw the same thing happen with black people. Uh, Afro-Caribbean sailors brought cannabis with them into ports like New Orleans, where it played a very important role in the development of jazz, and then spread throughout the American mainstream, largely along the same routes that jazz music spread. And um, in, 19, in the 1930s, uh, there was a campaign to make cannabis illegal at the federal level, which was driven by a guy named Harry Anslinger. Um, Anslinger's real agenda was racism, but he, he dressed it up in, in the jacket of cannabis. And why is it becoming legalized again now? It's becoming legalized again now because the real truth about cannabis is coming out. So the breakthrough in the cannabis reform movement, which has basically been going on almost ever since cannabis was made illegal. Many people don't realize it, but in 1944, the famous mayor of New York City, Fiorello LaGuardia, uh, uh, organized a commission on cannabis. And, uh, and that commission uh, said all of the same things that we know to be true about cannabis today, that it's not addictive, uh, that it does not cause so psychosis, that it does not cause criminality, and that, in fact, there's a lot of good science to demonstrate that it's medically effective. Um, it really took until the 1990s for change to happen. And it happened in San Francisco during the AIDS crisis when a, a wonderful guy named Dennis Perone, a, an old friend of mine, uh, who was an underground cannabis dealer, started noticing that those, again, Dennis, Dennis was a gay man, so he is deep into the gay community. The gay community of San Francisco at that time is just being devastated by AIDS. You know, thousands and thousands of people are dying. There's no remedy. Nobody really knows what's going on. But Dennis is a dealer and he deals to the gay community and starts noticing that that the people who are who have AIDS, who are using cannabis are living longer and having a higher quality of life than people who are not consuming cannabis. So he immediately starts giving away as much cannabis as he can. He goes to all of the cannabis growers that he knows and explains that he wants to give away the cannabis to AIDS patients so that they can live. And he starts this just underground distribution. And, um, and it caught on. It became a, a, a big thing in San Francisco. Eventually, the cops realized what Dennis was doing. They came and they arrested him. And Dennis's response was to uh, was to go public and to uh, get an initiative placed on the ballot in San Francisco in 1991 to legalize medical cannabis. And that's really what kicked us off into the modern era of cannabis reform. And the medical side of cannabis has been around for a while, but the the retail side where you can just walk off the street and purchase it, that's that only happened just recently. Um, what was that? Like, what was the catalyst for that transition? Because forever it was about, you know, like it's for medical purposes, but now it's kind of shifted where you can just walk into the shop and get it. So what changed? Well, I'll talk about the state of California. Of course, in, you know, in the United States, we have a, a, a situation where federal law still uh, uh, does not recognize any medical use or any legitimate use for cannabis whereas a majority of the states under their state laws do recognize that cannabis uh, is, is useful either for medical purposes or for what we call adult use, which means mm -hmm. any purpose um, whatsoever. Adults can just make up their own mind about whether to use it or not. Like chocolate, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in California, from 1996 until 2018, we had a loosely regulated nonprofit medical cannabis system that basically envisioned um, groups of, of growers um, uh, uh, coming together and pooling their cannabis into uh, dispensaries, into collectives, and then providing that to the patients. 
that's how I built Harborside was on that legal structure. But there's always been a desire to have completely legal cannabis. Um, for, there were a lot of people who wanted to consume cannabis, but didn't see themselves as being ill, didn't see themselves as being sick. And they didn't feel comfortable going to their doctors and lying and saying that they were. Or in many cases, even if they were using cannabis for therapeutic purposes because of stigma, they didn't feel comfortable talking to their mm -hmm. healthcare providers. So there's always been a desire to make cannabis, com you know, completely free um, uh, and legal like any other consumer product is. And that's really what was driving the, the movement in California. Um, in 2016, we passed another initiative which legalized cannabis for all purposes, not just for medical purposes. But, but one of the big changes was that we went from a nonprofit market to a for-profit market. Mm. At mm. roughly the same time, the Canadian stock exchanges, where, where cannabis is legal at the federal level, opened their stock exchanges to U.S. cannabis companies. Mm -hmm. So this really changed the scene in California, which previously was, you know, a lot of people who really came out of a, a sort of a hippie milieu who had a personal relationship with the plant, who really believed in it, um, who were running the industry to now you more and more are seeing cannabis corporations in California that mm. are financed by the public markets that are usually managed and operated by people who don't have much, if any, relationship with cannabis uh, whatsoever. And so you've really seen, you know, quite a dramatic change in the nature of the cannabis industry in my home state of California in the past mm -hmm. few years. Yeah, the cannabis industry um, is big business now. And with legal sales projected to reach around 22 billion by next year. Um, that's if I have the stats right, right? Um, but that wasn't always how it was. And so what was it like starting a business at the very beginning? Well, it was, uh, it was scary. Um, when we first opened Harborside in 2006, the federal government uh, was raiding even state licensed and legal dispensaries. Uh, and so I didn't know whether I was going to come home at the end of my workday or whether the federal government would raid us and I'd go to prison in handcuffs. Um, uh, so it was, it was scary. Uh, and, and, you know, we met with a lot of resistance, even though the city of Oakland had licensed us and, and we uh, enjoyed robust support from the community and from the uh, city government, there were individual cops who didn't like the change. So we had this one cop who liked to park down the street from Harborside and he would do everything he could that he was allowed to, to harass people. So he would pull people over. He would ask them where they had been. He would, he would make them take all of their product that they had purchased at a Harborside and put it on the hood of the car. He would photograph it. He would intimidate people. And um, and he wasn't technically doing anything that that he wasn't allowed to do, but but he was really making life very difficult for us. And, you know, fortunately, because we did have a good relationship with the community, because we were hiring from the community, because we engaged with the community, we did things like participated in gun buyback programs. I actually had a very good relationship with this officer's superiors at the police department. And so he found himself transferred to one of the less desirable beats in Oakland uh, mm -hmm. as a result of his activities. So there was just, you know, there's that kind of resistance that you run into. Um, uh, even after you change the law, you have to fight to make sure that the law is actually really faithfully enacted. And so you have to do that side of it, but at the same time, it's also, it's also a business. So how did you promote the business or, you know, so what was your strategy there, especially like, you know, with the fear and with, the federal laws versus state laws, like, you know, so what was your strategy there um, just to get the message out? Well, it, it was uh, it was difficult because one of the things that the regulations that Oakland um, uh, imposed on us in the beginning is that we were not allowed to advertise in any way, shape or form uh, whatsoever. Uh, and so it was really word of mouth uh, and is, is what we had to go on and news articles. So, you know, one of the reasons that I've, I've become so adept at doing interviews and I'm interviewed so much is for the first three years of our existence, I was allowed to give interviews to the news media and tell them what I was doing and describe mm -hmm. what was happening at Harborside. I was not allowed to buy advertising to do the same thing. 
And so instead of putting money into advertising, I hired a really good publicist and, uh, and, and, and put a lot of time and attention into telling our story uh, to the public. So that was one of the, 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 the things that we did differently at that time, most other dispensary operators were afraid if they gave interviews, then, you know, they would be the next on the federal government hit list. And so they, they stayed quiet. Mm. And it went from that point um, to being publicly listed. So what was that journey? I mean, how did that even happen? Because that seems like from that point, it seems so far away to be on the stock market. And so what was like in a kind of highlight uh, level, um, the process. Well, I mean, the, the basic reason that we ended up on the Canadian stock exchange is because we were very, very successful at, at building a, a, a cannabis business. And so within our first year, we were at $7 million a year in, in annual revenue. By the end of our third year, we were at $20 million uh, wow. uh, of, of annual revenue. And we continued, we continued growing from there. And uh, we're over $60 million a year in, in, in revenue now. So, you know, that, that the basic reason is, is, is that we, you know, we, we became very good at providing the kind of cannabis to cannabis consumers that they, that they want. Um, uh, the, there were a lot of legal changes that needed to happen along the way. And, you know, um, we almost didn't make it to those legal changes, um, mm. you know, by law uh, until 2018, we were a nonprofit organization. And so you, you, you couldn't go public. We were, we were a nonprofit. And in 2011, the, um, four U S attorneys, federal attorneys in the state of California decided that they were going to close down California's cannabis industry. Um, I think they hoped to do that before, uh, Colorado and, and other States passed adult use, which, which mm. was getting ready to happen in 2012. Mm -hmm. It was sort of the last stand of the prohibitionist. And, uh, they, um, they used two tactics. One, they applied, uh, uh, tax laws to us that, that didn't apply to anybody else and tried to basically tax us out of existence. Mm -hmm. And they tried to seize the properties that we were, that we were located in. And um, so uh, another reason that we became very well known was I refused to, to knuckle under to those attempts and we fought them uh, both. Um, and uh, eventually uh, we won in the, in the case of the property uh, seizure. Um, so in it, what set us up for the public markets was in 2018, California became a, a for-profit uh, cannabis industry. And, uh, you know, at that time, um, it was at the same time, the Canadian public markets basically opened up to, to U.S. companies. And, um, and it, was, it was the place that made the most sense to go to get growth capital. Uh, we are expecting to see, a, you know, a lot of growth in California uh, in 2018, 2019. Uh, mm. It didn't quite turn out that way. But the, you know, the purpose of going public was to get the growth capital that we needed to, to stay up as the market expanded. And so why didn't it happen in 2018 and 19? Because of uh, the way that California went about legalizing cannabis. And let mm. this be a cautionary tale to all of my friends in Australia. <laughs> Please. Um, the temptation is to accept legalization on almost any terms because because we're being arrested and people are going to jail and having their yeah. lives destroyed. Mm -hmm. Be very careful. Do not give in to that temptation. Um, uh, in California, two things happened, which have really crippled the industry here. One, the uh, industry was overtaxed. Um, we, in the, in the old uh, system prior to 2018, the maximum tax rate was about 10%. And it was lower that, than that in some parts of the state. Um, it, at post 2018, it's now gone to over 40% everywhere in the state. And at the same time, the um, state imposed a lot of very um, heavy requirements for growers and manufacturers to enter from the underground market into the legal market. And, and it basically costs hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of dollars to, uh, to set yourself up for the kind of operation that you need in order to be licensed. Mm. And so two things happened. On January 1st, 2018, you had cannabis consumers coming into dispensaries where they used to pay 
10% tax and they're getting charged 40 or 45% mm. tax. So they're running out of the dispensaries. Their hair's on fire. They've got <laughs> sticker shock. They're going, what's going on? Yeah. And they run right out into the hands of all of the growers and manufacturers who are unable to get licensed by the state because of the uh, over rigorous requirements. So mm. basically, uh, overtaxation and overregulation have largely strangled the legalization baby in its cradle in California. I think that we'll come out of that eventually. It's you know we are still the largest legal cannabis market in, in the in the world today. Yeah. Um. Uh. But um. But it's it's really been slowed down, and the full potential of it hasn't been achieved yet. So why are there some companies that are on the stock market like? The Green Thumb Industries, for example, which I think its market cap's around seven billion dollars. Well, how does it get such a big uh, valuation? Well, there are some companies that have been really, really successful at uh, at raising money, uh, acquiring licenses, and focusing on states that have a limited number of licenses. So, um, uh, you know, in in a lot of the states that you see the multi-state operators focusing on. They tend to focus on states, uh, A, that don't have an underground market that they have to compete with, and B, that have a limited number of licenses. And, uh, and I think that that's been a successful strategy uh, thus far for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, eventually uh, businesses have to compete on the basis of their own strengths, not mm -hmm. on, the, on the basis of differences in, in licensing and regulation. One day, there will be a more or less free market for cannabis in the United mm -hmm. States and around the world. And I think that, you know, that the challenge for companies that have that have leaned on licensing advantages is going to be able is going to be using that lead time to really build themselves into companies that can truly compete in a free market. So it's been legalized, but it's more been legalized for corporates that have the big dollars to um, to come in and to basically own the limited licensing that's available. And so the general entrepreneur will kind of have a hard time to launch a business in the current environment. Is that like a fair statement to say? Yeah. I'll, let me give you a, a you know, a personal um, Please. Uh, uh, experience there. So, you know, my organization competed in Nevada um, unsuccessfully and, um, and, you know, at, at that time we, we, you know, I, I thought that we were amongst the most adept people at winning licenses. Um, and, and we put together a license application that we, you know, we had six great big boxes of documents and it, it took two, uh, people with dollies to, to wheel all of those boxes into, uh, the office to submit the applications. Well, we knew we were in trouble when we saw van loads of documents pulling up that had that that were sent there by some of the biggest law firms in the state. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is that when you have a limited number of licenses that are going to be awarded and they are generally awarded on the basis of, of who has the most meritorious application, you have large companies who spend a great deal of money to put together the most meritorious application. And, and, and in some cases, that means just the application itself. But also, um, you know, if you have the ability to lock up properties, if you have the ability to put together a very impressive board of directors and an advisory board, if you have the ability to put together a compliance department that features former DEA officials, um, uh, if you can put together a board of directors that features a former speaker of the House of the U.S. Uh, uh, House of Representatives, generally you are, are more able to get through that licensing process than people who have been underground cannabis growers for the past 20 years mm. um, and, and don't have that kind of track record to show to regulators. Sounds like some big challenges there. Um, how did you persist through what I imagine would have seemed like insurmountable challenges, like, you know, across the last two, three, four decades? Um, I just, don't quit. <laughs> you just don't quit. I just don't quit. I mean, there's one sure way to lose and that's stopping. Uh, and I, I was just never willing to do that. And, um, how, I don't know. I mean, there were times that was very, very difficult, Alex, in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, you know, these commercials would come on television with like a fried egg on, 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 on a griddle and talking about how this is your brain on drugs. 
and they were very much including cannabis in there. And um, and we were really made to feel like we were pariahs. There were times when I didn't have a clue whether we were ever going to be successful. But I knew that that for me, I just, you know, I knew the truth about this plant. I knew the potential about this. plant. I knew that this plant has the ability to save this planet. And I wasn't willing to give up that possibility, that struggle. It was something that I was called to do. And I felt like I had to execute on that. Sounds like it's something that you're extremely passionate about. And we'll come back to that in um, uh, shortly. Um, But just back to business quickly. um, At the point that it became for profit, yeah, um, back in 2018, aside from the manufacturing and the dispensaries, like were there any other types of businesses that were launched at the time that became successful? Well, there, you know, there are a lot of various different kinds of cannabis businesses, both licensed and unlicensed that have developed over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, On the license side, um, I would say that the the licensing itself did not give birth to any new product categories. In fact, to some degree, the process of licensing um, dampens innovation uh, and slows innovation down. Um, uh, And I, 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 I'm not sure that that's true, but, um, but I'm not sure that it's really given birth to, to any of the new and most dynamic areas of cannabis. But, um, you know, so I'll talk about um, uh, one of the most interesting innovations that's happened here recently. Hmm. There's an Israeli company that's just opened a, a campus in, uh, in California, and they're using CRISPR technology uh, to work with the cannabis plant. And What's that? It's basically gene editing technology. Um, So it's the same technology that's used to create genetically modified uh, organisms. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, and that technology can be used in one of two ways. It can be either be used uh, as a um, laboratory to um, to use natural breeding techniques and enhance natural breeding techniques and move them a lot much more quickly or to actually create genetically modified organisms. Uh, I'm not sure what the approach of this company is, and I'm not going to mention their name uh, anyhow, yeah. but, um, but it's, it, it's, it's very interesting that they're using this, tech, their, this technology. Now, what's also interesting is what they're trying to do with it. They want to produce a completely THC-free genetic variety of cannabis. Uh, and that they say that they want to do this in order to make sure that industrial hemp crops don't run hot. Um, uh, I think there's better solutions uh, to doing that. Um, uh, I'm very suspicious of, 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 of genetics that try to get rid of THC entirely because I, I know it to be one of the most valuable components in the cannabis plant. And it's really uh, research that's being driven more by, by prohibition and, and, and the demands of prohibition than, than, than the plant. I'd rather see them working to develop um, varietals of cannabis that are specifically targeted at specific medical conditions mm-hmm. or varietals of cannabis that will be more resistant to specific different types of pests or diseases. Um, uh, so mm. I, I think that, 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 um, but there's what I say to, to anybody who's looking at the cannabis industry and thinking about the scope of it is this, whatever it is that you already do, whatever it is that you're passionate about, you will be able to find a place to do that in the world of cannabis because Cannabis has been illegal since the birth of modern business technology and practices. So whatever it is that you do in business, if you do software, if you do marketing, if you do formulation, if you do compliance, if you do investment, it doesn't matter. There's plenty of room for you to take those skills into the world of cannabis because it's, it's a blank slate. We need to figure out how to do all of these things with cannabis now. There's some commentary out there that um, that all the money um, in um, legal cannabis industry uh, across say California like and the US at the moment has already been made. It's too hard to break in right now. Is that a true statement or not? No, no, it's absolutely not true because the industry is just in the beginning uh, phases of being built out here. Important to remember that we still have, I think the current count is around 15 adult use states 
and and around 30 states that have medical cannabis laws. Mm -hmm. We will anticipate eventually that all of the states are going to are going to have adult use laws. Um, and so just building out the whole infrastructure of, of, of that business, um, uh, the entire supply chain mm -hmm. um, uh, is is going to be a huge job and it's going to have massive opportunities uh, in in front of us. Um, and I think that lots of times people fail to understand the true magnitude of, of what cannabis is and what it can become. <clears throat> and really, you know, if you take a look at what's happened with the disruption factor in legal cannabis markets, you know, what we found is the cannabis is already very significantly disrupted alcohol by a factor of 15 to 25%. You see a drop in alcohol sales in every legal uh, cannabis state. Uh, same thing with pharmaceuticals. You see a market drop drop in pharmaceutical and prescription uh, uh, writing, uh, especially of opioids and, and, and painkillers and tranquilizers. So you're seeing a very significant uh, disruption there as well. Um, we're just beginning to see the kind of market disruption that's going to happen as hemp is increasingly used as a raw material too. Um, you know, keeping in mind that anything right now that's made out of a petroleum or a tree or cotton or a number of other raw materials can instead be, be made out of hemp um, and in a more cost effective and, and eco friendly way. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we're really just, you know, looking at the beginning of what of what this is growing into, I believe by dollar volume. Maybe not in my lifetime, but probably in your lifetime, cannabis is going to be the most valuable product on the planet. Yeah. And I don't think people truly understand the consumer demand because it's that kind of that hybrid where like it was illegal. Now it's becoming legal, but they don't really know yet what is the total size of the market. Is that right? Like that's like, oh, yeah. could you talk about the size of the market then? Because maybe I got that wrong. Yeah. Like, like is there kind of estimates like on the legal versus the illegal size well, of the market? Of course, <clears throat> of course, the illegal market is basically impossible to quantify because yeah. everybody hides it, right? I just so, wanted to check just I was, because I was making a statement, but I thought, hey, let me ask the question instead. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it, 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 you know, from, from, from a point of view of actually having a real confirmable evidence, um, we just don't know the size of the, of the underground market, mm -hmm. but it's massive. Right. And, and we, and we do have the barometers of what's, of what's happened in the U S states that, that have legalized. So, you know, if you take a look at what's happened in Colorado now, you find that prior to legalization, if you asked people how many people consumed cannabis, you know, 10, 20 percent of people would admit to some level of cannabis use. Well, now 40 percent of adults in Colorado who are being polled on whether or not they plan on using cannabis uh, at some point in the next year say yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, we, you know, we're going to see growth from two for two factors. First is the underground market be becoming legal. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and that's big, but we're also seeing that when you make cannabis legal and you remove the stigma, more people try it. And usually when people try cannabis, they find it useful in their lives. So there's these two factors of growth going on. If all that was going on was bringing the underground cannabis economy into the legal cannabis economy, you're talking trillions of dollars mm -hmm. worldwide. Um, but then once you, once you ask yourself the question, okay, so what happens if 25% of people who are consuming alcohol worldwide now start consuming cannabis? Mm -hmm. um, and then you start asking yourself, okay, so what kind of impact is that going to have on things like insurance? What kind mm. of impact is that going to have on things like rehab clinics? Um, uh, so you'll see all of these, these impacts are going to flow through society. It's not yet legal here in Australia, the same as it is in San Francisco or Colorado. What do you think it takes for it to become legal here as well? Well, accurate information is, is, is really the most important thing. What we know is that whenever there's an evidence-based debate about cannabis, 
uh, that people who are open to new sources of information, uh, when they get the information, they change their mind. So the greatest example of this is Sanjay Gupta, the chief medical correspondent for CNN News. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Gupta was an opponent of cannabis legalization up until the point that CNN asked him to do a deep dive into the subject. And he and he did a documentary on cannabis and exposed himself to the real science. And once he exposed himself to the real science, he actually apologized for his previous stance against legalization and now has become one of the foremost proponents of legalization. So accurate information is one big part of it. But accurate information isn't always enough. When you have such a hot button topic like this, where both sides have been trading various different allegations and studies and science and back and forth for years and years and years and years, people are naturally suspicious of all of the sources of information. So what we found in California is that change really began to accelerate after medical cannabis had been around long enough that people who normally never would have allowed a joint to come anywhere close to them tried medical cannabis because they were in a desperate medical situation. They had mm -hmm. no other choice and they found that it worked, that it transformed their lives, in some cases saved their lives. Mm -hmm. And then those people would go to all of their friends and relatives who are also mostly people who would never ever have anything to do with cannabis and related their experience with it. And then that group of people tried cannabis when they needed to and had the same set of experiences. And over time, you reach a critical mass where, where people's direct experience with the plant is, is the best antidote to the years of propaganda that they've, that they've received. So it's, it's really a combination of, of two things, right? One, accurate information, and then two, trusted sources for that information to flow through. And if you're advising entrepreneurs in Australia about preparing for legal reform, what would your advice be? Uh, well, my advice would be... Um, uh, don't be afraid of the gray area, right? Typically, there's, there is a period of reform where you're making incremental reforms uh, like we did in California um, uh, after we passed medical cannabis. And there weren't a lot of very specific regulations. There was this sort of gray area that was, that was left up to people to figure it out. And daring and bold entrepreneurs like me rushed into that gray area. And because there weren't a lot of regulations, because because a lot of the details hadn't been worked out, we were able to do a lot of that work. We were able to do it in the way that we wanted to, and we had a lot of freedom. After four or five, 10 years, it, it takes a different period of, of time in different places. You generally end up with a much more um, robust set of regulations. And, and those regulations, while they will make your legal situation more safe and certain, will also constrain the room that you have to move in as an entrepreneur. So be careful. Uh, don't take risks that you can't manage well, but also um, learn to value that, that gray area. Learn to value those first few years as a period of time when you can you really have more freedom to innovate and create new business models than you probably ever will in the future. And where do you see the cannabis industry going next? Like, will it become as prevalent as uh, say, for example, as alcohol is uh, today? I, you know, I think that one day um, cannabis is going to be much more prevalent than alcohol in terms of human consumption, just because, you know, alcohol is a rather crude nerve poison that leads people into reckless and destructive behavior. And when consumed on a chronic basis leads to a whole range of mental and physical health uh, issues. That's just not true with, with cannabis. You know, people can safely consume cannabis on a daily basis for their entire lives and not suffer the kind of mental and, 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 and physical damage that you would from, from alcohol. And, and, uh, and it doesn't cause the kind of uh, reckless behavior. Cannabis makes people more contemplative. It tends to, to make them more, more socially responsible, to think a little bit more about the people around them. Um, uh, the opposite of, of alcohol fueled behavior. And you see that again in the public health statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take a look at, at states like in the state of Washington, after they legalized cannabis, the number of rapes and thefts relative to their neighboring states that did not uh, uh, legalize dropped from 15 to 30 percent. 
Um, uh, the rate of domestic violence has dropped in states that have legalized cannabis. The rate of traffic fatalities have dropped in states that have legalized cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, the rate of violent crime dropped 10 percent in the city of Denver, Colorado, in the year following the legalization of of cannabis. So I think that um, already I think there's a lot of parents who when they sit down and they have the talk with their kids, they say, look, when you're at the party, uh, there's going to be a room that has the alcohol in it and there's going to be a room that has the cannabis in it. Just keep on walking past that alcohol room and you can go into the cannabis room. <laughs> be careful. OK, yeah. Um, uh, so I, I, I think that um, I don't think it's going to take more than one or two generations for that change to happen. OK, one or two generations. So this is a long term uh, game right now. This is a long term transition, isn't it? And and part of your mission, it seems, is to change the message around cannabis in the world. So what's the message which you're trying to get out there? Well, my simplest message is, is that, you know, we uh, in the planet today are in 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 dire situation um uh you know uh, we in 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 our bodies we are you know we are using medicines that often make us worse from their side effects than they do um uh in what they're intended to to cure us of right mm -hmm. our societies are seeing uh, all kinds of of trauma uh people are at their each other's throats uh, all around the world uh, the planet itself is uh, is overheating. Um, you know, we've known for now, again, for generations that we're poisoning the air and we're poisoning the water uh, mm -hmm. and we're failing to do anything about it. And I think cannabis offers us the best chance for the healing of our bodies, of our societies, of our souls, and ultimately of, of the planet. And cannabis um, awakens uh, us it makes us more conscious and then gives us the raw materials we need to build a new kind of world. Mm. And is that what the cannabis manifesto is about? Like it, that's your book that you wrote about it, right? Is that what that book's about or what's that book about? Well, that's, that, that will be more the next book. Uh, the cannabis the manifesto yeah. uh, really talks about the history of, of cannabis, how it's been used through the ages Mm -hmm. Talks about the history of prohibition, and and it and it sets forth a series of arguments um, about why cannabis should be legal. So I wrote the cannabis manifesto mainly to to do two things: one, to empower people who already believe in cannabis reform with the most effective arguments, mm -hmm. and number two, to win over people who were still on the fence. Okay, and, and that was why I wrote the book. Um, I'm working on another book called The Cannabis Renaissance mm -hmm. and the, the Cannabis Renaissance, which is also available now as a speech um, on my website, stevedangelo.com. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's being expanded into a book. And that's really uh, where I set forth the this vision, this idea that if we really embrace cannabis, if we imagine a world that embraces cannabis to its to its fullest, right? Um, you know, I think about uh, all of the trucks that are uh, that 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 are bringing us packages. Well, you know, imagine that truck and the body of that truck being made from hemp bioplastic. Right? Mm -hmm. Imagine all of the boxes in that truck being made from hemp cardboard. Mm -hmm. Imagine that truck operating on electricity generated by a hemp powered power plant or on hemp biodiesel. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine the uniform of the driver of that truck being made out of hemp. Imagine her shoes and socks being made out of hemp. Imagine her going to a cafe for lunch and sitting at a table that's made out of hemp fiberboard, eating a salad that's dressed with hemp uh, salad uh, oil dressing, uh, having a pizza that's made out of hemp flour and going home that night to a home that's built of hempcrete. Right. Um, uh, that's carpeted with uh, natural hemp fibers instead of toxic extruded petroleum. All of these things are possible now. And, and the kicker, right, the kicker is that for every hectare of hemp that we harvest, we sequester 20 tons of atmospheric carbon, 20 
tons of atmospheric carbon. So not only does this plant give us the raw materials that we need to build the stuff that we need to live and be civilized human beings, mm. but it also allows us to first stop and then eventually start dialing back the climate change, which it's, 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 a, it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of life or death. Either we get a handle on that or our children's children's children don't have a place to live. There's a lot of products that you just mentioned. So my question before about, you know, what are some of um, the businesses that people can get into? I mean, you just listed 20 to 50 of them. So that's really interesting too. Um, can you quickly talk about the last prisoner project? Yeah, happy to talk about that one. It's one that's very close to my heart. Mm. Um, the last prisoner project is a nonprofit organization that I launched in 2019 in order to make sure that as we build this legal cannabis industry around the world, that we don't forget about the people who are currently serving time on cannabis charges. And, you know, you would think that um, that once society decides that something shouldn't be a crime anymore and changes the law, that the people who are being punished for that thing that we decided shouldn't be against the law anymore would stop being punished. But that's not what's happened in the United States. You know, we've we've passed all these cannabis reform measures, but we still have 40,000 people uh, doing time on cannabis charges. And in some cases, they're just, you know, serving ridiculous sentences, uh, life sentences, in fact. So Last Prisoner Project uh, was formed to address that problem, just to make sure that as we build the legal industry, all of our prisoners are are released and given the resources they need to rebuild their lives. Again, that sounds like another very big task um, to make that change happen. Us, how are you approaching this challenge? Well, the same way that I approach all of my challenges, right? I, um, I'm really a visionary. I'm, I'm not a manager. Uh, I depend on angels uh, who see these visions and help me wrestle them down to the ground. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the power of my words really uh, comes from my ability to, to, to articulate what's in the hearts of millions and millions of, of people. And, uh, and I believe that, that, um, that there are hundreds, I know that there's hundreds of millions of people around the world who love this plant, who have welcomed it into their lives, um, who view it as a teacher. Um, and I, I also know that those people uh, are going to be highly motivated to make sure that everybody who's in prison uh, because this plant eventually eventually gets out. So um, I just started talking about it. I started talking about this issue. I started talking about how I thought there needed to be an organization and people started volunteering to, to help run it and started volunteering to contribute money to it. And so within a pretty short period of time, uh, our brilliant executive director, Sarah Gersten, Harvard Law School grad, uh, basically said, Steve, I'll run this organization for you. And, uh, and then our amazing uh, director of operations, Mary Bailey, basically at the same time said the same thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the two of them got together and, um, and there was great chemistry there. And um, and, you know, my real role has just been to introduce the idea of people and, and ask them. Um, and, you know, one of the ideas I had was that we would go to the legal cannabis industry and ask them to support the the organization. And so um, we've done that and the organizations uh, and, and the industries, you know, come through in a, in a very significant way. Um, so it's a simple mission, um, but it's a, it, as you said, it's really ambitious. It's a huge mission mm -hmm. uh, and it's global. Um, we're, we're talking about every single cannabis prisoner on this planet. I, um, I, you know, I, I think that, that there are hundreds of millions of us around the world that have been touched by this plant. We are a tribe and, uh, and we need to make sure that we take care of, of, of all the people who carried this plant through the dark years of prohibition. Stephen. Thank you for talking us through uh, your vision, story, the industry, and uh, your mission. Yeah. Um, how do people support the last prisoner project? 
So there's a, every a, there's a ton of ways you can get involved um, a, from something as simple as uh, following us on your social media and promoting us um, to uh, getting involved with the organization, becoming a fundraiser, donating uh, or joining our staff. So to learn more about that, go to lastprisonerproject.org. And uh, we have an annual report up there now. You can read all about it, find out mm -hmm. how to link up with us. And you can find out uh, more about what I'm doing. I've got this uh, Radio Free Cannabis podcast, which is now turning into a TV show. So you can find me on YouTube, all the, the usual channels there, also on the Social Club TV um, mm -hmm. app and, yep. uh, and, uh, and online. And um, and uh, let's see, Rolling Stone just did a new profile on me. So folks might want to saw that. That was that good as well. Yeah. yeah. And where do they get um, the Cannabis Manifesto from if they're interested in finding out more? The Cannabis, cannabis Manifesto is available on Amazon, uh, audiobook, um, uh, Kindle and uh, hard or paperback. And to get in touch, they visit uh, your website at stevedangelo.com stevedangelo.com or you know drop me a line steve at stevedangelo.com steve and, uh, then the ig handle is at steve.dangelo that's fantastic steve thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh this has been such a fabulous conversation thank you so much my pleasure alex anytime be well thank you thanks for listening to the growth manifesto podcast if you enjoyed the episode please give us a five-star rating on itunes for more episodes, please visit growthmanifesto.com forward slash podcast. And if you need help driving growth for your company, please get in touch with us at webprofits.io.